Hi there, this is Michael Price. Today I'm going to talk about what is evolutionary psychology, and this is for PY 5704, Foundations of Evolutionary Psychology. Um, and so this week and next, weeks three to four, I'm going to be speaking on the origins and nature of what we are calling evolutionary psychology. Uh, and this name may sound pretty generic, but I'm going to be using it to refer to a very specific approach to psychology that I will define very uh, precisely today. Uh, this is really just to give an, an overview of this, of this approach. Uh, we'll be talking, obviously, in a lot more detail in our discussions on Thursday of this week and next week. This is just a video to kind of introduce you to the central concepts and to get you started thinking about what we mean by evolutionary psychology. Um, and so you may be familiar with evolutionary psychology. You may think you're quite familiar with it. Um, it's an approach, however, that may be unfamiliar to many of you, um, even if you are familiar with other approaches to evolution and behavior. So the, re the relationship between evolution and behavior can be studied in lots of different ways. Uh, this different approaches that have different names. Some of these names, sociobiology, that's kind of a, uh, an old school term. It's not used as much anymore, but you may have heard that. Uh, behavioral ecology is used frequently. Uh, cultural evolution. Uh, and then the study of gene culture coevolution or dual inheritance theory. So these are all approaches to, to evolution and behavior that you may have heard of, may be familiar with, but they're very different than the approach I'm going to be talking about today. Now, because there are so many different approaches to evolution and behavior, it can get pretty confusing. Um, especially if you're not real familiar with any one approach, um, you know, from the outside, they can all seem like maybe just the same thing. Um, you know, you're studying evolution and behavior, that's what you're studying, there's one way to do it. Um, that really is not true at all. Um, adding to this confusion, however, is the fact that the term evolutionary psychology sometimes is used in a really broad, generic sense to refer to really any approach uh, that combines something to do with evolution, be it biological or cultural evolution, and then something to do with behavior or psychology. Um, it's kind of used in that generic way to refer, it can be referred to as evolutionary psychology. However, again, that's not what I mean by evolutionary psychology. I'll be referring to something much more specific. Um, so I'll be referring in a narrow sense uh, to evolutionary psychology, and I'll just refer to it as EP. So what does set EP apart from all those other approaches? Well, there's a number of things. Uh, we can start by pointing out that more than these other approaches, EP tends to focus directly on the psychological level of analysis. Um, now, some of these other approaches, like sociobiology, behavioral ecology, are going to focus more on the outward observable behavior as opposed to the inner workings of the mind and the brain, uh, the, the, the psycho psychological aspects of the behavior. So, uh, and then other approaches like cultural evolution, gene culture coevolution, they're going to be focused more on cultural behavior and behavior at the level of the cultural group, uh, as opposed to directly on the psychological mechanism. And now EP focuses on the psychological mechanism because it brings in these ideas from cognitive psychology, uh, and then it, it marries those up with ideas from evolutionary biology. So what we mean by that is from cognitive psychology, we get this idea uh, that the mind is composed of information processing devices or mechanisms that can be thought of as if-then devices. And by that we mean uh, if there is some particular kind of information present in the environment, then the mechanism or the device, it produces some kind of psychological output that can lead to behavior or an emotional response. Um, so for example, if there is a snake-shaped object or a spider-shaped object in your, in your environment, uh, then experience fear and back away from that object. Uh, and then from evolutionary biology, we're bringing in these very central ideas of selection. And you've learned in weeks one and two about natural selection and sexual selection, these evolutionary processes of selection that can fashion uh, biological problem-solving devices we call adaptations. We'll say a lot more about adaptations in just a moment. So when you marry those concepts up, you, get, you give birth to EP. Now, EP is also associated with a very specific set of people, 
at a specific place, the University uh, of California, Santa Barbara. And the people who are really most instrumental in developing evolutionary psychology uh, were Don Simons, first of all, in the 1970s. And then later in the early 1990s, uh, husband and wife team of Lita Cosmides and John Tooby arrived at UCSB. And they are really seen as the, the main architects of modern evolutionary psychology, Tooby and Cosmides. Now, UC Santa Barbara, in full disclosure here, I attended UCSB. I got my PhD there, and Tooby and Cosmides and Simons were all, all on my PhD committee, along with Don Brown. So I'm obviously biased. I'm a, I'm a big fan of this approach. Um, and uh, uh, you're going to get a, a, a view of UCSB style, EP, uh, that is pretty favorable. And obviously not everybody's going to be as favorable, as favorably disposed towards, towards it as I am. Uh, but, you know, I'm a big fan. Uh, and so here are some of the people I'm talking about. Don Simons, who in 1979, he wrote this book called The Evolution of Human Sexuality. Um, and that cover, by the way, is actually a, a human egg covered with human sperm. And Don Simons told me he was very disappointed when he saw the cover design of this book because you can't tell at all what that is. It looks like some kind of fuzzy eclipse or something. But in any event, it's a landmark book, a groundbreaking book. Um, considered by a lot of people to be the, the, the first work of real modern evolutionary psychology. Um, if you want to go back to Darwin, and he wrote The Expressions of Emotions in Man and Animals in 1872, uh, and that's often considered sort of a, a, an early, you know, landmark work in evolutionary psychology. But in terms of the modern science of EP, uh, Don Simon's book is considered to be uh, really the, the, one, of, one of the really important publications that started it all. And then a little bit later, in 1992, Tuvian Cosmides, uh, pictured here recently, this is taken, I think, in 2019, this, this photo, but their book is from 1992, The Adapted Mind. I've assigned a chapter uh, as part of your assigned reading for this week and next, uh, which is sort of their manifesto, the, the Psychological Foundations of Culture, a very important chapter which appeared in this, this landmark book, The Adapted Mind, in 92. So it's so associated with UCSB, we could really call you EP, uh, sort of UCSB school, evolutionary psychology. Um, but it's also associated with some pretty well-known names who are not at UCSB. So uh, David Buss, who wrote the textbook from which I've also assigned some readings uh, this week and next, uh, is a professor at University of Texas now, uh, and a famous evolutionary psychologist. Steven Pinker at Harvard is a cognitive psychologist who's probably the most famous popularizer of evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychology. He's written some very well-known books uh, that have adopted the approach of Tubian Cosmides, such as The Language Instinct and How the Mind Works and The Blank Slate. Uh, and then Mark Daly and Margo Wilson, another husband and wife team, uh, to some extent have adopted the, the Tubian Cosmides style of, uh, of thinking about evolution and behavior. Um, it's, it, their approach is quite sympathetic and quite consistent with the Tuvian Cosmides approach. So all of those things distinguish EP from other approaches, but if we had to name one single concept that was most central in distinguishing EP, uh, it would have to be the concept of adaptation. It's such an important concept, I put it in red font here, uh, just so you won't forget it, and you'll recognize its significance. But what do we mean by adaptation? Well, I'll define it here. Uh, an adaptation is a trait of an organism, an organismal trait, that is functionally specialized to solve some adaptive problem. Okay, so uh, by adaptive problem, we mean some problem that is a, presents a barrier to survival and or reproduction. Um, and so an adaptation uh, is, is, the func is the functionally specialized trait itself but it's also a design principle. The principle of adaptation is the basic organizational principle that explains the way in which all organisms uh, are designed. Uh, design in quotes because the designer was a non-conscious, non-intentional process of, of, of selection. Nevertheless, it gives the appearance of having been designed. Um, and so we can think of an organism as a bundle of adaptations, a bundle of these functionally specialized problem-solving devices. And maybe that sounds a little bit um, abstract, but we can make it much less so uh, 
Um, if we just think about, well, here's one of the all time famous examples of not just an adaptation, but a very complex adaptation. This is uh, the human eye, uh, and it's a uh, really complex, well orchestrated, coordinated uh, grouping of these, these mechanisms that all work together to, to enable the organism to see. Um, so that's just one example, um, but you know you don't have to look very far in your own body to find many, many other examples of adaptations. Again, uh, functionally specialized devices that solve some problem related to survival or reproduction. So just you know the the, the human torso is full, full of organs that are adaptations um, that are functionally specialized for one thing or another. So for example, the heart functionally specialized to pump blood. The stomach functionally specialized to help digest food, etc. Uh, this is all we mean by adaptation. Uh, it's such a fundamental concept we almost forget it's it's there. I mean, this is just we we take it for granted that this is the way that organisms are organized into organs. So by joining up cognitive psychology and evolutionary biology, EP enables us to finally understand the brain and the mind. Okay, to understand it as being composed of these information processing devices uh, that are in fact evolved adaptations. Um, and so we can think of the brain and the mind as a bundle of adaptations, just like we'd think of an organism. And it's also important to note that these devices, uh, they evolved in the distant ancestral evolutionary past. In human ancestral environments, the environments of our evolutionary ancestors, um, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago, um, to solve specific kinds of adaptive problems that our ancestors faced in those environments. So they're adapted to the past, uh, not to the present. And these environments are referred to in EP as the environments of evolutionary adaptedness. Uh, that's a term that was coined by the famous developmental psychologist John Bowlby, and it was converted to the acronym EEA. It's often used in evolutionary psychology uh, by Don Simons. He, he uh, introduced that acronym in the evolution of human sexuality. Uh, and that's another really important concept to which we will return. Uh, but for now, it's just important to remember that uh, the kind of environments uh, to which our mental adaptations are adapted are very different than the ones we live in now. Okay, they're the environments that are best represented in terms of uh, modern societies. They're best approximated by hunter-gatherer societies, uh, tribal societies, uh, and so a lot of work in EP focuses on studies that are conducted in these kinds of small-scale societies because they're the types of environments are the, the closest we can come to approximating uh, the types of environments that our adaptations were designed by and for. And we can think of that as, you know, evolutionary psychology is really concerned with the full spectrum of human societies, from the hunter-gatherer societies to modern uh, state-level societies. We want to know how these evolved adaptations that compose our minds, how they, uh, why they evolved in those environments of the past, and how do they function then in the environments of the present. Finally, uh, one other point about EP that distinguishes it from, from other approaches is it has this clear aspiration towards being part of a conceptually integrated view of human knowledge. Okay, So it sees uh, scientific knowledge as being part of this grand puzzle, and evolutionary psychology is trying to fill in some of the pieces of that puzzle. And in fact, the introductory chapter of the adapted mind is called Evolutionary Psychology and Con Conceptual Integration. And so Cosmides and Tubi thought this, this concept was so important that they actually kicked off their landmark book with a chapter devoted to considering conceptual integration. So I'm just going to say a little bit more about what we mean by conceptual integration. So I'll say a bit more than about conceptual integration uh, and the unity of knowledge. Um, and if we're thinking about what is the most fundamental kind of scientific knowledge, we'd have to say physics, because that's concerned with the, the really basic laws and parameters that characterize our universe at the mo in the most fundamental sense. Um, and then a level up from that, a little bit more, getting more complex is chemistry. Uh, but still, all the laws of chemistry have to be consistent. It has its laws of its own, 
but those have to be consistent with the lower level laws of physics. And then a level up from chemistry, we get biology. And once again, we're getting these you know, theories of, of natural selection and sexual selection, for example, that are unique to biology, but need to be consistent with the lower levels of chemistry and physics. And then a level up from, from biology, we get psychology. So now we're looking at uh, entities with brains and minds. And uh, we're finding out that we need special laws to explain the behavior and the psychology of specific species. But these also have to be consistent, again, with the lower levels of biology, et cetera. And then a level up from psychology, we get social sciences. And this is what we study when we're studying uh, entities with brains that are interacting together in societies and cultures. Uh, so again, another degree of complexity, but still we need to be consistent with these lower levels. In order to understand what's going on at this higher level of, of complexity, we need to understand the more fundamental levels of psychology and biology. So EP is primarily fitting in here at the psychology level, um, but it's obviously striving to understand the theories and principles of biology in order to better understand psychology and indeed to generate um, <clears throat> hypotheses, hypotheses and predictions at the psychology, psychological level, level that are likely to be correct. And EP is also focused on this higher level of the social sciences, okay? It's also concerned with people acting together um, in groups and cultures. And indeed, the Adapted Mind, that landmark book that I talked about by um, Tuvian Cosmides and Barkow from 1992, it's subtitled Evolutionary Psychology and the Generation of Culture. Uh, so it's, this has always been a focus of EP, is trying to understand societies and cultures. But the thing about EP that sets it apart is it's also, it's realizing that in order to understand behavior at this more complex level, we need to stay rooted in an understanding of psychology and then biology. So that is just a, a sort of a roundup of some of the main concepts of evolutionary psychology, just to give you an idea of what we're going to be talking about when we talk about EP this week and next week. Uh, and then I want to just say a few words about the readings. Uh, I mentioned I, I assigned a couple of chapters from David Buss, uh, Evolutionary Psychology, the New Science of the Mind textbook. This is the sixth edition from 2019. Um, and I've assigned chapters one and two uh, chapter one is the scientific movements leading to evolutionary psychology. So it, it will look at some of the historical uh, origins of evolutionary psychology because that's really important to understand what, what EP is trying to do. You have to understand where it's coming from um, and what sort of, why was there this need for EP um, historically? And then uh, chapter two will focus more on the contemporary science of, of evolutionary psychology and we'll go deeper into a lot of those principles that I've talked about already, like adaptation, especially. Uh, and then I've also assigned this very long chapter from the adapted mind that I referred to earlier. This is the psychological foundations of culture. And so this is the most important chapter uh, in the most important book about evolutionary psychology that's been published. So I, I really thought it was important at the master's level that you, you read this. Uh, it's it's long. It's not easy, but if you uh, you know if you understand it, you'll really understand a lot about EP. Uh, and so I've divided it up into two halves, part one and part two, um, so to make it a bit uh, more digestible. So that's the reading for this week and next. And um, that's it for this uh, preview of what's to come. And thanks for listening. And I'll see you on Thursday. Bye bye.